Well, hello everyone. It's good to be here today. My name's Serena and uh, I'm from Grace Christian Fellowship. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today from uh, Luke chapter 10. And uh, the title of the sermon is, Who is my neighbour? So uh, I'm going to read Luke 10, verse 25 to 37, which I'm sure you'll all know is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, it's a parable we've all heard many times before. So I'm just going to read from verse 25 to 37. And it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanting to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was and when he saw him he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Amen. 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 So again, a very familiar scripture. Sometimes I think we're in danger when we come across a very familiar scripture uh, of jumping through it a bit quick. I know this one, Lord, I'll just jump on to the next chapter. I know I'm guilty of that sometimes. But I just thought we could look at something slightly different today and perhaps learn something else. So we're going to look first of all at the man who asked the initial question, because if we're not careful, we can perhaps miss who it was. This was an expert in the law. Uh, it says in verse 25, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So there's a few things to notice, first of all. He was an expert. He was what we might call a lawyer. He knew the law off by heart. He knew it extremely well. He wasn't just some ordinary, common, uneducated man. He was educated. And he should have been able to answer that question very easily. In fact, we get the impression that he probably could. He just wanted to know what Jesus thought about it. Perhaps he wanted to trap Jesus. Scribes and the Pharisees were always, always doing that just to see if he could say something contrary to the law so that they could accuse him. Now, Jesus, obviously, knowing that the man was um, testing him, he throws the question back at him. He says, you're a lawyer. What, what does the law say? So the lawyer says, well, it says that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. And Jesus says, yes, that's right. If you do this, you will live. You'll, you'll have eternal life. That's exactly right. Now, I thought it was interesting. The man could have left it there, couldn't he? The expert in the law. He could have thought, yep, yeah, that's OK. Jesus has answered this correctly in terms of, you know, the scriptures. But he pushes the question for some reason of his own. Verse 29 says, but he wanted to justify himself. So there was something about this, about, you know, who was his neighbour that he wants to find out about to see if he's doing it right, to see if he's justifying in liking the people that he likes and not liking the people that he doesn't like. That's perhaps his motive. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? What does the law actually mean? This is what he's saying. 
when it tells me that I have to love my neighbour. What's it actually saying? Does it mean just the people living either side of me, you know, either side of my house, or just the people in my street or my village? What does it mean? That's what he's trying to, to sort of probably have a little bit of a dig at Jesus and maybe justify himself in the process. Now, the Jews would only have considered an Israelite a neighbour. They wouldn't have considered anybody else, um, not a foreigner, not definitely not a Samaritan, um, which Jesus brings up later, uh, who they had disagreements with, perhaps not even one of the heathen or the poor. He might not have considered those people as his neighbour. So he asked specifically, who is my neighbour? He wanted to hear Jesus' interpretation of this particular point. And it's interesting because thanks to the lawyer pressing this point and perhaps trying to justify himself, we get to hear the Son of God's interpretation of that part of the law. We wouldn't have had that if the lawyer had gone away after asking the first question, what do I do to get it to eternal life? And Jesus answers. If he'd have left that, we wouldn't hear this beautiful story, this wonderful interpretation of what it means to love our neighbour. So we can kind of be grateful to this lawyer whose motives were not entirely genuine, perhaps. But we get to hear what Jesus thought. And we know Jesus comes up with this wonderful story and gives this wonderful clarification on a little point of the law. And one thing that occurred to me with that was that it's very important when we read the scripture to hear Jesus's or the Holy Spirit's interpretation of it. Because we can read scriptures, and I'm sure we've all heard of people or groups of people that took a scripture out of context and made uh, a theory about it, a doctrine of it. So the important thing is, is to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say, because then we see it with fresh eyes completely. I'm sure that's happened to all of us, a piece of scripture that we've all read before, one that you pass over, and suddenly the Lord brings it to light. It's almost like he shines a light on it. And you think, I never saw that before. I never heard of that. And it's, it's God's illuminating a piece of scripture that makes such a difference. And it's almost like that's what happens here because the expert says, well, who is my neighbour then? Who is my neighbour? So Jesus opens up the scriptures for us. So it's not just a dry command. Um, we find out what God meant, perhaps, when he spoke it to Moses on the mountain. Um, something more than just loving the people who live either side of me, loving the people who are in my church, the ones that I agree with anyway. It's more than that, isn't it? Um, an English minister called William Clarkson, who lived in the 1800s, said this. This was a very pertinent question, who is my neighbour, by whatever motive it was prompted by. None better could possibly have been asked, for it drew forth Christ's own interpretation of his own law. Isn't that lovely? Amen. His own law, and we get to hear the author explain what he meant when he wrote that. I thought that was incredible. So... We go on and Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. We know it, don't we? He stops to help a wounded man on the road. A priest and a Levite come by. They pass him and leave him there. The Samaritan, an enemy of the Jews, uh, he stops. He helps him, takes him to the inn and tends to his needs. Uh, and of course, the point is that this stranger is the one who shows charity and kindness and compassion rather than his own people, perhaps. And so Jesus tells this story, we know, to open the eyes of the lawyer um, and perhaps bring conviction to a heart that's been hardened by religion, uh, eyes that have been closed to the real truth of the law. They were very keen to follow all the tiniest bits of the law, to say, we've done this, tick, kept that bit of law, I've done that tithe, tick. But they miss the greater, weightier things of the law. That's the point that he's bringing. And, you know, like the lawyer, our eyes and our minds can be dulled to the scriptures, can't they? We can, as we said, hear it before. Oh, I know that bit. I won't take as much notice of that. I'll skip over it. You know, it's like that for me with the parable of the sower. 
Whenever I get to that point, if I'm reading through the scriptures, I get to the parable of the sower and I kind of think, oh God, I've read this so many times. I'll just hop over it, which is a shame, obviously, because I'm sure Jesus has something else to show me on that point. But, you know, it happened to the scribes and the Pharisees as well, didn't it? They were so familiar with the law in a religious point of view that they forgot to perceive the true meaning of it. The word has a much broader meaning, a deeper meaning, and it is rooted in love and mercy, all of it. Because the whole purpose of the law given to man is that God can show his love. God can reveal his mercy and his kindness to sinful man. So, you know, we don't want to be like, like the lawyer. But as if that insightful parable that Jesus gives of the Good Samaritan wasn't enough, Jesus then tells the lawyer something very specific. He says, go and do thou likewise. So rather than just telling the story and leaving it there for him to make his own assumption and, uh, and to walk away thinking, oh, well, you know, that doesn't apply to me. Jesus points out the, a piece of truth and says, you go and do likewise. And that must have convicted him. Because there was obviously a point where he wasn't doing perhaps what he should have been doing. Perhaps he wasn't being a neighbour to the poor, the perhaps the unlovely. Um, the point was that he should show mercy and kindness to anyone, everyone in need. No matter who they were, what country they came from or what their status in life was, which we can sometimes, a trap that we can fall into. But you know that, that's really all I've got to say about that. But it reminded me of a scripture in the Old Testament. In fact, it is so similar that as I was going through it, I was thinking, this is amazing. It's almost like one of those comparison scriptures. And the scripture is where um, David is king and Nathan is the prophet. Uh, and David has a man called Uriah killed. Uh, who's a soldier in his army, sends him to the hottest part of the battle with the intention of him being killed. Um, he has him murdered so that he can have the man's wife, Bathsheba, who, who is pregnant by the king. And it's a very similar story compared with the lawyer who comes to Jesus. A story is told, um, a very insightful story, that brings conviction and then a point is made at the end you go and do likewise we see this happening in the story with David and Nathan as well so Nathan the prophet comes to King David and he has obviously been revealed by God what David has done or perhaps someone has told him that he's taken Bathsheba and he's had her husband killed so Nathan comes in to King David and he tells him seemingly quite innocently, a story, a parable, uh, an event uh, of a poor man's lamb, his only lamb, who has been killed by a rich man. Now, the rich man has plenty of sheep, plenty of lambs, but he decides to take the poor man's only lamb that was very beloved to the family. Anyway, David listens to this story and he's furious. He says, who did this? This man must be killed for his cruelty. This is terrible. This is wickedness. And what does Nathan the prophet say to him? He says, you are the man. Wow, what a terrible moment for David. What a shock. That revelation through this insightful story, a parable that brings conviction and points out uh, an area of failing, a sin in his life. Uh, and he ends up by saying, you're the man. David had ignored his conscience in a big way and allowed himself to be tempted. And it took the word of God through Nathan, the prophet, to show David his sin um, and cause him to repent. Uh, and you know what? Only the word of God can do that. There is nothing like the word of God for revealing our sin, is there? No. We think we're going along well. We might have an inkling that something isn't right, but we're very good at covering it up, saying, justifying it, saying, it's OK, I, ha I had to do that. I was all right to do that. And suddenly we read the scriptures, we hear a sermon. The word of God cuts through it all, all of our excuses. And we are cut to the quick, aren't we? With conviction. 
It opens our eyes, brings conviction, revelation and understanding to our true nature, to the true attitude of our heart, to what our behaviour is really like. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, this is a lovely scripture, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Wow, that's exactly what Jesus does to the lawyer who's trying to excuse his behaviour perhaps. It's exactly what Nathan does uh, in a word of God to David. Um, it's incredible. The word is living and active, it says in some scriptures. It's not just the same as, you know, stories that we might write. It's not man's words. It is the living word of God and it is true. It's alive and that's why it can penetrate our heart and have such an impression on us when we either need comfort and support or when we need conviction. Amen. It's quick and powerful, sharp like a cutting sword. Amen. I'm going to read you from the Amplified here of that same scripture, Hebrews 4.12. And the Amplified is a longer version, I'm sure you know. And it says, For the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energising and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating the deepest parts of our nature, Amen. exposing and judging the very thoughts and the intentions of our heart. Amen. Incredible, isn't it? Yes. I'm sure we've all read through the scriptures and something has leapt out of us or spoken to us whereby we said, oh, Lord, I'm doing that. I'm the man. I'm the one doing this, Lord. I hear it in your word. I've seen it now. It says it exposes and judges the very thoughts and intentions of our heart. Amen. Thank goodness it does. Praise the Lord for that. Both in the example that we saw with Jesus, exposing the thoughts and intentions of the lawyer's heart, and for Nathan, exposing what was going on in David's heart. Only God can do this through his word, which is why it's so important and which is why it's so hated today, which is why when someone goes to preach out on the street, uh, there's such a violent reaction sometimes against the word of God, because it is a two edged sword that pierces our heart. And no one can say I wasn't affected by it. No one. Amen. Only God can do it. So I thought it was really interesting how similar those two scriptures are. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Just two little beacons of light, almost, you know, connecting a bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God saying, it's all right. I did it in the Old Testament. I'm still doing it in the New Testament. Nothing's changed in that sense. Both scriptures deal with a high ranking official. So the lawyer was, you know, fairly high ranking. David was obviously as the king. Both scriptures. Both, in both scriptures, both men have sinned and uh, in some way have disobeyed the law, even if it was just that the lawyer wasn't loving his neighbour. In both scriptures, the men were both self-righteous, justifying their own behaviour. Even if we see from David going, this is terrible. What's this man done? He's killed a lamb. Oh, I would never do that. No, you've done worse. You've murdered a, a woman's husband self-righteousness trying to hide or justify their sin Amen. in both scriptures a parable or a story is told to reveal their true feelings and correct the men of their lack of mercy both show a lack of mercy <coughs> david in terms of murder the lawyer perhaps in terms of you know judging people not loving someone enough Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Nathan tells the story of the poor man whose only lamb is taken by the rich man. And in both scriptures, the meaning is very, very personal at the end. Jesus says to the lawyer, you go and do likewise. Go and do what you should be doing as someone who is so knowledgeable in the law. Amen. And Nathan says to David, you are the cruel man who has killed someone. Amen. It's you that's done it. That's the word of God. The word of God is personal 
in our lives and it should be. It's supposed to be challenging us. It's supposed to be cutting us to the quick so we become purified and uh, made our actions are even more righteous than, than perhaps they would be without the, the influence of the word. So that's the power of the word of God. Amen. Amen. So let's keep praying, keep reading. We might think, oh Lord, I've read this a hundred times. And maybe we do read it 101 and don't get that much out of it. It doesn't matter because if we're reading, then the Holy Spirit is there to bring a little point up and say, you could be improving in that, or you've done that really well, you know, or comfort. You know, oh, Lord, I can't do this anymore. Yes, you can, because when you're weak, you're strong in me. So keep reading. Keep asking God to reveal the truth to you from his word because we need it every day as our food. As our food. As our food. Heavenly manner. Absolutely. It's exactly that. Um, particularly to help us show mercy to those in need. Amen. Perhaps for the weaker, the lower, the more needy than we are. Have we ever said we, we don't want that person here because... They don't quite fit in, you know, they're a little bit rough, they're a little bit noisy, they're perhaps not quite polite enough. But, you know, those are the people that we need to have mercy on and show kindness to. So praise the Lord. Let's keep our eyes ever open to the Holy Spirit's leading and um, pray that he re reveals the truth and revelation of his word to us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.